Good afternoon and welcome to the 619th meeting of the Economic Club of New York in our 114th year. I'm Barbara Van Allen, President and CEO of the club. As many of you know, the Economic Club of New York is the nation's leading nonpartisan forum for discussions on economic, social, and political issues. Our mission, we feel, is as important today as ever as we continue to bring people together as a catalyst for conversation and innovation. A special welcome to members of the ECNY 2021 Class of Fellows, a select group of very diverse rising next-gen business thought leaders, and welcome also to the graduate students from Fordham University and Columbia University that are joining us today. It is a pleasure for me now to welcome our special guest, Floyd Abrams, Senior Counsel, Cahill, Gordon and Rendell, LLP Litigation Practice Group. Floyd has a national trial and appellate practice and extensive experience in high visibility matters, often involving the First Amendment, securities litigation, intellectual property, public policy, and regulatory issues. He has argued frequently in the Supreme Court in cases raising important issues as diverse as the scope of the First Amendment, the interpretation of ERISA, the nature of broadcast regulation, the impact of copyright law, and the continuing viability of the Miranda Rule. Most recently, Floyd prevailed in his argument before the Supreme Court on behalf of Senator Mitch McConnell as amicus curiae, defending the rights of corporations and unions to speak publicly about politics and elections in Citizens United and federal election versus Federal Election Commission. His clients have included the McGraw-Hill companies in a large number of litigations involving claims against its subsidiary Standard & Poor's Financial Services, LLC, the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case, and others, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Time Magazine, Business Week, The Nation, Reader's Digest, Hearst, AIG, and others in trials, appeals, and investigations. He has appeared frequently on television, on Nightline, on NewsHour with Jim Lair, Charlie Rose, and other programs, and has published articles and reviews in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Yale Law Review, the Harvard Law Review, and elsewhere. Thank you for being with us today, Floyd. Thank you. The format today will be a conversation, and we are very fortunate to have Peter Coy uh, doing the honors for us. Peter is an uh, economics writer uh, for the New York Times opinion section. Uh, thank you, Peter, for joining us. Well, thank you, Barbara. Um, people who know me may think that Barbara just made a mistake by saying I work for the New York Times, but I have a new job as of today. I spent almost 32 years with Business Week under McGraw-Hill and then Bloomberg Business Week under Bloomberg LP. And uh, today's my new job with the New York Times opinion section covering economics. So um, this this is, wish me luck. <laughs> um, but this is, there is an uh, economic aspect, of course, to what Floyd Abrams does because of course, information is crucial. The free flow of information is crucial to uh, a successful market economy. And uh, that means all kinds of information, including news. Um, it so happens that I've worked, I'm now working for the New York Times, which Floyd Abrams has, has represented in several important cases, including one we'll be talking about, which of course is the Pentagon Papers case, which was decided uh, 50 years and one month ago. Um, and of course I worked for Business Week uh, when Floyd Abrams was counsel for them as well. So uh, Floyd, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I wanna start out with a case that you were not involved in, but I wanna start in going with chronological order back to 1964, which was uh, New York Times versus Sullivan, a uh, crucial case that established the uh, standard for actual malice for First Amendment cases. And that standard is now under threat. Uh, two justices of the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas and Neil Gorsuch, have 
called for a review of that case, whether it should be overturned by the high court. Can you talk about the importance of that 1964 decision and how you feel about the idea that it might be overturned? Uh, that decision was <clears throat> really one of the most important First Amendment rooted decisions uh, in our history. Uh, it arose at the time when the New York Times and other, call them national publications, were really at risk of not being able to cover the civil rights revolution in the South because they were sued and sued again uh, in front of Southern white angry jurors who imposed very high uh, judgments against them. And I mean really the national press at that time. And so when the case came up and it happened to be about an advertisement in the Times about uh, the jailing of Martin Luther King and his treatment in prison. And the Times was sued because of the ad by the sheriff of Birmingham uh, in Alabama. And there was a large judgment against the Times. And the question when it got to the Supreme Court was, well, well what, what sort of rules do we need to protect First Amendment rights uh, at a time like this in a country like ours? And the court really shifted gears. When I was in law school, libel was a separate area of law, no First Amendment side to it. There were rules about what was libelous and what not. And there were times against Sullivan, the court in a sense took a deep breath and said, look, in order to assure that there can be free writing about controversial issues, controversial people and the like, we need more than just to say, is it true or is it false? In part, because we really just can't trust juries, at least then, to make those decisions. And what the court said was, if the press publishes things in good faith, if they publish the articles about people in power, believing what they were saying with true was true, and without a, sort of a high degree of awareness of probable falsity, that that's protected speech. Uh, that was 1964. That has been the law since then. Uh, it's been expanded beyond public officials like the sheriff uh, in Birmingham to prominent public people. Um, and it has become more recently uh, rather uh, 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 under the gun of some of the more conservative jurists who uh, Justice Thomas's view was that it was wrong from the start. That was not what the First Amendment means or says. Uh, it doesn't say anything about libel uh, as such one way or the other. And Justice Gorsuch wrote an opinion just a few weeks ago joining Justice Thomas and saying that the opinion should be reconsidered in light of a variety of new factors. So the enormity of Facebook, social media, and the like, the impact on American society. Uh, and uh, some jurists uh, off the Supreme Court have said uh, that because the, uh, uh, the largest media entities tend to be more liberal, uh, that the public isn't getting a fair depiction of the news. And therefore, we ought to go back to the law as it was pre New York Times against Sullivan. Final thought, this is a case which has been cited uh, around the world as the quintessential American and uniquely American First Amendment decision. Uh, there's no doubt that one of its results is that books are published here, which simply cannot be safely published elsewhere. The Cambridge University Press a few years ago commissioned a biography of Putin. And when they finally got it, they said, we're, we're sorry, we can't publish it. We believe it. We can't publish it in England uh, because he could sue us here uh, and, and 
we don't have enough basis to be sure we would win. I think the book was published here, and of course, there was no lawsuits. So we have fewer litigation now because of that. Indeed, that's one of the things Justice Gorsuch mentioned in his opinion. He was saying there are so few libel cases now that that, that is a reason or at least a cause for suspicion that the court had gone too far in protecting the press or writers or publishers. Okay. You know, obviously I tend to be sympathetic at this point of view as a journalist, but I feel an obligation to push back a little bit on this and, and uh, question the, the decision and, and your advocacy of it. Uh, one of the things you sometimes hear is that the, too many people um, are wrapped in under the uh, category of public figures people who really are not truly public in any kind of way. And that there's almost like a presumption that if you raise your head in any way to participate in the democratic process, that you're then exposed to the full gale force winds of, you know, of uh, investigative journalism and whatever kind of headlines. Um, so I want to ask you that. And then the, the second part is whether, uh, as some people say, and uh, this was said by Lawrence Silberman of the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, that it kind of seems to enable journalists to feel that they have a sort of a cloak of invincibility and maybe encourages bad behavior because they feel they can get away with anything knowing that the, the Supreme Court decisions behind them. What, how do you feel about those two thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, first on the subject of a, who's a public figure, uh, how should I say, I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to the notion that maybe the court has gone pretty far down the line in treating anyone who was really, really publicly known as a public figure in the same way as a public official who for better or worse is doing the public's business. Uh, I mean, I'm not so sure that that you know every Hollywood star uh, or or a professional football player, when that person says something or something is said about them, that we really have to wheel in the First Amendment uh, as as a level of protection. I mean, there are arguments about that, but I, from from my perspective, but that is a, a closer call. That, that said, uh, I really don't agree with uh, Judge Silverman uh, in, in an opinion of his, uh, also quite recent, which I thought was an intensely political opinion. I mean, he, he really is upset at what he views as the, the too liberal or too left or too pro-democratic views uh, of the press. Uh, which it seems to me ought to be off limits as a basis for making or changing uh, law. Because uh, I don't think, and this is something I think I know something about, I don't think that, that, that the large American publications you know, feel so immune and are, and are so morally corrupt that they, they purposely publish things they don't think are true uh, or purposely don't engage in serious efforts to determine what is truth or falsity. The real question about New York Times versus Sullivan, I think is, suppose they do engage in serious efforts. Suppose they do believe what they publish. In England, in Canada, that would not be a basis for protecting the speech. We do protect the, the speech and we protect it on a policy level at least because we think it's so important that that sort of speech, speech about public policy, a biography of Putin, for example, that, that it's really important that, that, that we lean in the direction of more freedom rather than less and fewer lawsuits rather than more. Yeah. So uh, with two justices already having weighed in with a view that 
Times versus Sullivan should be reviewed. Is there a chance that that might actually happen considering uh, the makeup of the court today? I don't think so. Uh, uh, I think Justice Alito might be inclined to join the, the two based on some things he has said occasionally in his opinions. Um, I don't think the Chief Justice or Justice Roberts uh, is at all inclined to do that. I mean, he, he has rather proudly described himself as the single most First Amendment oriented member of the court. Um, and I think he's also really disinclined to reverse the, the most important First Amendment case, perhaps in our history, I would say the, the most important majority opinion. We have a lot of great dissents from Justice Brandeis and Holmes, sure. but majority opinion. I think the most important one is New York Times and Gallup. So I don't see him. I don't see Justice Kavanaugh, uh, who wrote a number of very, uh, what should I say, vibrant uh, uh, opinions when he was on the Court of Appeals, protecting speech. I, I just don't think he'd be there. So, you know, with the court as it is, uh, I think the opinion is probably safe, but, uh, yeah. but you never know. And, I, I, and, I know that Amy Coney Barrett uh, clerked for Silberman, so some people have yeah. said she might be a vote for her. Yeah, yeah. Look, you never know. And, and Justice Kagan, 30 years ago, who wrote an article, she wasn't on the bench then, she wrote an article raising the, the very first question you raised to me, do we really need all this protection for public figures, especially with a very broad definition of who a public figure is? Yeah. So yeah. you never know, but I, I, I really don't think that, 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 that they're close to taking on this, this truly uh, landmark a, a decision, which again is defines us uh, around the world. Yeah. Well, great. Um, I meant to mention when I started that we do have a chat function within this Zoom and we welcome your questions. They'll appear to me and Mr. Abrams and I'll pick out some and ask them. Uh, so go ahead and fire. I understand from Barbara Van Allen that there are a bunch of uh, attorneys on this Zoom conference who know a lot about this stuff and can probably answer, ask much more sophisticated questions than I can. So please, please weigh in. Um, I wanna jump ahead uh, seven years to uh, New York Times versus United States, the famous uh, Pentagon Papers case for which you were co-counsel. And um, that was a, another big victory uh, for the press. That was not a uh, actual malice case. It was a prior restraint case. And can you talk about, maybe talk a little bit about the human side of things. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg, the, the environment around the Vietnam War at the time. The, one thing I, in, in reading up on this, I hadn't really remembered that there was this close connection between the Pentagon Papers case and the Watergate break-in. Uh, these two seminal events uh, were actually closely connected. So I just want to hear from somebody who was there uh, what it was all about, what it was like. Well, all this started in 1968. Uh, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara uh, looking around and like everyone else, couldn't think of a way out of the war in Vietnam, which was raging and raging and uh, endless, so it seemed. No way to win unless we were to do things that we were never prepared to do. We're not going to drop an atomic bomb in Vietnam or something like that. Uh, a lot of American soldiers getting killed every day. McNamara asked the Department of Defense to, to write up for him a sort of what are we doing there? How did we get into Vietnam? Write, write a history for me of how we got into Vietnam and who said what to whom. Uh, and so they wrote a historical study, uh, starting with 
World War II and the French in Indochina? And uh, did we start to help them a little bit back as far as that? And going up until 1968, uh, when the study was completed, uh, it was based entirely on Defense Department documents, uh, many of them uh, classified at the highest level, top secret. As a result, when the report was finished, uh, given the way the classification system works, every page had on it stamped top secret sensitive. Uh, there were, there were uh, uh, 17 volumes and more, 7,000 pages of which 3,000 were text. And every text page had top secret stamped on it. Daniel Ellsberg, had been a Marine uh, in, in Vietnam, uh, an, an intellectual uh, uh, who had been in favor of the war and came to view it as not just a mistake, but a war crime. Uh, uh, he had been involved, uh, he was involved in drafting a section or two uh, of the Pentagon Papers. And his view was that it would help end the war if the papers were known, because most of all, the most sort of incriminating or uh, dangerous from the perspective of the government point of view was that it showed that American presidents had not been upfront, had lied in many cases to the public about why we're, we were in Vietnam and how well things were going when they weren't going well. And even when the presidents knew they weren't going well, uh, etc. Um, and those, those 4,000 pages also included one section called the negotiating volumes dealing with efforts to end the war by the use of our allies in Australia, Canada, and elsewhere to help get us out of it or to end, end the war. Ellsberg tried to end, uh, enter CBS uh, and uh, other publications in it uh, that they said no. And then after a long process of, that I won't go into, the New York Times obtained uh, a copy uh, which they literally copied page by page. Remember uh, that uh, there were no uh, computers to speak of uh, in those days. There, there were mimeograph machines uh, and the like. The Times got a copy. Uh, it did not get a copy of the negotiating volumes because Ellsberg thought that might be harmful to ending the war if that was published. But they, they got just about everything else. And they spent three months in the most secret circumstances, rented rooms in the Hilton Hotel where they did all their work uh, uh, so that if, if the government came into the Times, it wouldn't be there didn't tell other people what they were working on, interviewed former CIA, Department of Defense, et cetera, people to make sure what they would publish wouldn't be harmful and began to publish on uh, June 13th, uh, 1971, a Sunday New York Times, uh, an article which they indicated there would be more of uh, about the case. Their lawyers, outside counsel had told them not to publish, uh, had told the, the then new publisher of the Times, uh, Arthur uh, Sulzberger, that he would go to jail, they would lose their television licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, great internal conflict within the Times. The decision was made to publish. Um, the Times called its lawyers, who at that point refused to represent them. That's how, in my good fortune, uh, in, in the, the middle of the night uh, after uh, the, the attorney general uh, had uh, sent a telegram to the Times telling them the government would go to court unless they stopped publishing. And the Times answered that they would not stop. By pure chance, pure chance, that very day uh, that the telegram arrived, it was the next day, June 12th. I hosted a lunch for media council who together had retained 
a professor of mine from Yale Law School, Alexander Bickel, to, to write for us a brief about confidential sources of journalists, which was before the Supreme Court. So that was the second day of publication. Everyone wanted to talk about that, not what Bickel came to talk about. And he and I, to a lesser extent, he, he was the star of the show. Uh, but both of us were heard to say, oh, the government will never go to court. This doesn't hurt the Nixon administration. It makes Johnson look bad, but not Nixon. And so the, they won't go to court. We said, with all the assurance, I've often thought, of lawyers without clients. So we, <laughs> we just let them know that. And of course we were wrong. And that night, the Times said no to the government. The government said, we're suing the next day. The Times called its outside counsel who refused to represent them after 60 years of representing them. Wow. And so, as one, one author later put it, they were like a, a vicar found in a house of ill repute at midnight with no <laughs> law. And they asked Professor Bickle to lead the team that would represent the Times in the case and that I and my firm at Gail Gordon would back him up and I would do whatever Bickle wanted me to do on it. Uh, he was chief counsel. So that's how it all began. It, the whole case from beginning to end took 15 days from the time the government sued till the time the Supreme Court decided with briefing and argument in the lower court before a judge who had been sworn in one day earlier. Murray Gerfein had uh, never had a case, his first case, the Pentagon <laughs> Wow. An appeal to the Second Circuit, an appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, judge Gerfein had entered an order barring the Times from publishing. That's when the Washington Post obtained its copies of, of the papers from Ellsberg. Um, and so the cases went up together to the Supreme Court. And by a six to three vote, the, the, the Supreme Court said the, the near ban on prior restraints, court orders, barring in advance what the press could print was so great that except in the most extraordinary case, the government would not be able to meet its burden of showing that it needed the prior restraint that badly. Yeah. And six judges signed on to that, uh, three dissented. I would say the critical moment in the case was when Bickle was asked by Justice Stewart, uh, suppose when we read the Pentagon Papers, we decide that a hundred young American men will die as a result of publication, men who had the bad luck to have high draft numbers uh, in those days. And Bickle tried for a moment not to answer the way good lawyers try not to answer terribly hard questions. And when pressed, he finally said that, well, if that was what you found, and you won't, but if that's what you found, then he said, my, my humanitarian views would overcome my more abstract devotion to the First Amendment, and then you could have a prior restraint. Um, so that, that's what the case decided. No prior restraint, even during war, and even when the government was saying that publication would irreparably harm the country. The court said, you've got to prove it to us that that is so because of the First Amendment. Uh, and this document just doesn't meet that sort of level of proof. Right. Uh, I wish we could go on to talking about this for hours, but I'm just going to restrict myself to just one question about that. Compare the Pentagon Papers case to the Panama Papers case. Uh, where uh, it was leaked by a non-journalistic organization, but later picked up by journalistic organizations, uh, including the Times. How do you feel uh, 
about a case like that and others that are presumably to come along those lines? Well, look, uh, the, the, the heavy burden in prior restraint cases, one might think is not as heavy in cases where it's a private party, not the government. Yeah. But it is the government because they're going to a court. You know, when the government goes to court and wants the imprimatur of the United States to say, you can't print that, the, the burden is, and ought to be in my view, very, very high indeed. Uh, and so, yes, there are situations in which either from a national security point of view <clears throat> or personal privacy point of view or, or the like, you know, something is published which does a lot more harm than any possible good it could do. That's the danger of, of leaning so far in the direction of protecting free press and freedom of speech in America. That's also what distinguishes us from really every other country uh, in the world. When the case was over, I happened to be in England uh, and, and the English press was stunned. I mean, the, the near ban on prior restraint started there. I mean, in a lot of areas like New York Times against Sullivan, we get much more protection, but, but it was in England that they initially said, uh, you know, restraints on speech in advance are all but barred. Yeah. But uh, we applied that and to this day, apply that with, with much more rigor and uh, we protect speech much more uh, than anyone else does, even in national security cases. Now, I think we have time for only one more topic and we've covered 64 and 71. I'm gonna jump ahead to the present day and I'm gonna read a question from uh, one of the people on the call, Chad Pollack. And then I will uh, boil it down to uh, social media as a topic. Given the prevalence of social online media and everyone's ability to freely share opinions online, globally, publicly, and within private isolated ecosystems, what are your thoughts on the moral role of media companies, traditional and emerging online outfits, algorithms, moderation regulation, 1A rights, and continued propagation of online access across the globe into younger generations, e.g., Twitter shutting down accounts due to violation of user terms while other platforms encourage and enable diametrically opposing terms and conditions. And that's a complicated question. I would just boil it down to your First Amendment uh, lawyer, but a lot of the cases that deal with speech now uh, aren't First Amendment cases because they involve um, actions by private players like Twitter, Facebook, and so on where the First Amendment doesn't apply the same way. Um, is, is, that a, is that a part of a law that's still in turmoil or, in, or there, how is that settling out? Uh, the, the, the distinction between public and private speech has always mattered uh, and, and still matters, which is to say, Facebook has First Amendment rights. It doesn't have a right to have 2 billion uh, uh, subscribers. I mean, it could be broken up under antitrust laws and, and limited in one way or another. But, but it, is, it is Facebook and, and its competitors that, that as a First Amendment matter, yes, they have the right to say to a president, as they did, we won't carry what you write. Twitter banned the president for life, President Trump. Uh, and he still, but Facebook banned him indefinitely. Facebook now has an, an internal sort of Supreme Court, <clears throat> which required them to say more and, and justify what they did more. But as, as a First Amendment matter, the, the law as it applies to Facebook is not unlike what it applies to the New York Times. Facebook can make the choice. Now that said, the, the, the question I, I think uh, uh, correctly and perceptively included the word, uh, the, the moral decision. 
And in fact, how should the Facebooks of the world behave? Um, and uh, without trying to make this sound simple, because it's not at all simple. I mean, my own reaction is that when Facebook engages in what is uh, called content moderation, uh, the notion of that is to me entirely appropriate. The New York Times does that too. Facebook doesn't publish, or they say, they try not to publish for certain racist speech uh, and the like. They have standards which are in some respects analogous to those that, that the press has. The hard question, and I think they're really difficult comes up, where at one and the same time, there is speech which Facebook decides or Dr. Fauci and other people, and now the president of the United States, urge them you know, not to carry articulations which are against vaccinations, say. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, I think the direction that that Facebook at least has gone in or has tried to go in is to distinguish between false statements uh, or misleading statements of fact, like uh, the inoculations will kill you or it's more dangerous to have an inoculation <clears throat> that, that, than it is not to, and opinion, which are leave us alone. You know, we're Americans, you can't shoot things in our arms and, and, and they're misleading you uh, and they're misleading you for political reasons. I mean, the more political the speech is, the more the Facebooks should tr try hardest not to get involved in, in a level of corporate censorship. No, but not, by the way, not because they're not allowed to, but because yeah. you just don't think, right, it's more of a moral it, issue? Well, it, 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 in light of their power now, I mean, there, there's no more source of information in the world today than Facebook. Sure. Uh, and, and if Facebook engaged, and in my view, they have not, but some people have argued that it has, if Facebook engaged in a sort of partisan, even strong leaning, in a partisan direction this way or that way, uh, that would be very uh, troubling very precisely because so many viewers don't think of Facebook as a political entity, but, but a truth teller. There's a picture, someone's there, someone's telling me something. Sure. It must be so they wouldn't allow, you know. Right. So, I mean, th th these are very difficult, uh, this is, a very difficult area. Um, I mean, when, when, uh, the, and, and there's no area more difficult than public health. Sure. So when, when the topic is, is a life or death topic, right. uh, at one and the same time, the, the Facebooks of the world have to try to allow the most extravagant Politi political criticism of the government or the like at the same time, in my view, they ought not to carry things which are uh, false uh, and not just false, but terribly damaging to public safety. And that line is not easy to, to, to draw and it never will be. Sure. There is never, there never will be a bright line is what you're saying. No. Yeah. So uh, just the last a couple of minutes here, uh, just tell me on a personal level what your life is like these days. You're a senior counsel at the firm that you've been at for many, many years. Are you still uh, working full time? I'm doing uh, less, uh, actually quite a bit less, uh, litigation. I, I am spending a lot of time uh, uh, representing uh, uh, the entity that, that is involved in artificial intelligence of people's faces 
uh, 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 its view. Um, but but uh, I've, I've been teaching at the Yale and Columbia Law Schools th th this last year. Uh, I've been writing. Uh, and now and then I get asked to do something like this. It's great. Well, it's a, it's, it's a rewarding way to into the final stage of a long and storied career. Well, thank you and welcome to the New York Times. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It looks like Barbara just popped up on the screen. Um, Barbara, do you want to uh, take over now? I think we're at a good point to, to, to uh, wrap things up. And I want to thank you both. What a great conversation. And thank you for bringing us forward and using uh, that question uh, from, from our member as well. So many thanks to you both. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, just in closing, I want to mention we tomorrow are hosting Tony Malkin. Uh, Tony is the president, chairman, and CEO of the Empire Trust Realty. And he will be interviewed by Gail King, and they will be discussing the future of New York, as well as uh, the commercial real estate market in New York and, and around the country. And to close out our summer events, we have two really great uh, events on August the 2nd. Uh, Scott Gottlieb, the resident fellow at the AEI, 23rd commissioner of the FDA, will be interviewed uh, by Becky Quick, CNBC's co-host of Squawk Box. He's going to share an update on COVID-19 and the implications of the fast spreading Delta variant as we head into the fall. He also has a book coming out uh, in September. So I'm, I'm hoping I'll mention a little bit about that. Uh, later that same day, we're going to host Steve Cadigan, who is the founder of Cadigan Talent Ventures. And he'll be talking about his new book, Workquake, which is all about uh, motivating and uh, returning workforces uh, in our new normal. Additionally, we are pleased to say that we've started confirming a number of events for the fall. Uh, just the first couple, Hans Vesberg, who's chairman and CEO of Verizon, uh, September 13th, he will speak on the future of telecommunications. And uh, that'll be followed a couple weeks later, September 27th, by John Williams, who is our chairman, of course, of the Economic Club, but also president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And he will be giving an outlook on the U.S. economy. So um, I would also just be sure I take a moment to recognize those of our 337 members of the Centennial Society that have joined us today as their contributions continue to be the financial backbone of support for the club and help us enable us uh, actually to offer this programming. So thank you again and everyone please stay healthy and safe.